breathe. I mean, I, you know, we want to keep each other safe, don't we? But we need to see smiling faces. We need to see, and it's been a while since I've seen loads of your faces. So I'm, if I'm peering, it's just so I can make sure I recognize, you know, who's who. But it, it's, I have to say, first off, it is an absolute privilege and a pleasure to be here with you all um, today. I had the, the privilege of being with the ladies uh, the other weekend uh, for Daughters of Destiny. But this on a Sunday morning, this is family, you know. And as Mandy said, this was my new home, and I, I'm someplace else, but I think, and I can't say too much because I'll start crying, but I think this will always be my home. Um, amen. Uh, there, as a church, as a fellowship, I've said to my mom, I've said to other people, what you do well here is you love. You are a fellowship that knows how to love. Um, and I'm just so grateful to have not had the privilege of being joined to you. And I think people in, in different situations um, get to come through here and feel that love. So don't change who you are and don't change what you do. Yeah, let the spirit continue to move through you and be that pulsing, beating heart. And I have to say, I think that's why Mandy and Martin um, have ended up as your pastors. Um, I remember always saying to Mandy that she's this walking, beating heart, you know, but you're all that now uh, together. And it's beautiful, beautiful. Right. Yes. Ooh. Oh, see, now I'm never going to get through this message now. <laughs> it's a good thing something told me. Oh, not that. That's something else. Okay, just my, yeah, just you. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, you know, I don't know if we need to continue on with the fruits of the Spirit. We've got love nailed down, don't we? <laughs> Joy for being here. Okay, and today we're supposed to be looking at peace and I thought, how do I come to this? You know, how do I come at this? Because the, the fruit of the Spirit, it's a wonderful thing to look at. It's a wonderful uh, bit of Scripture to think of all these um, Christian graces as they are that Christ wants to develop in us, that God wants to develop in us through the Holy Spirit. And But when you start to pick them out individually, as Mandy will tell you, it's difficult because they kind of overlap and they all work together. Um, I think you gave the example of the orange, didn't you? And, you know, because it's not fruits of the Spirit, it's fruit of the Spirit. So it is indeed just this one fruit with the various segments. They all kind of work together. And, you know, as with any fruit, perhaps one segment might be a little sweeter. Another might be a little, mm, a little, mm bit sour still, okay, hasn't finished developing. So they are all part of one. And I thought, well, how do you pick out peace? You know, how do you pick that out and look at it? And I found myself looking um, through the passage, the whole passage, to see that you start to understand what the peace is about that Paul's talking about by looking at the wider context of the passage. And he's actually painting a war. He's painting a war. So um, I don't know if, if the scripture is there, but I'm going to just read the passage. So Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 26. That's sort of the basis. I'll just read it. If you have a Bible, follow along. I'm in the New American Standard Version today. No King James, okay? All right. I thought I'd be nice. All right. So Galatians 5:13. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say... Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, 
idolatry, witchcraft, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. Let's not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. And so there ends the reading. So looking at these passages, we see these verses here. Paul is painting a picture. Oh, hello. Hello. I'll give him a chance to get settled. Paul is painting a picture of war. A picture of war. There's battles. There are conflicts. This is the language of conflict that he's using here. Verse 13, he's trying to point to the fact that there should be peace and unity amongst them. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, he says. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. An opportunity for the flesh. I was reading in one commentary. In the Greek, that phrase actually uh, relates to something that happens in war. So it's about an opportunity for the flesh or opportunity for, it's about like setting up a base from which you can then launch an attack on your enemy. So he's saying, don't set up a base for the flesh to now launch an attack on you, to launch an attack on your spirit, but instead serve one another through love. And he says that the whole law is fulfilled um, through that one statement, love your neighbor as yourself. And then he again starts using this combatant sort of language. But if you bite one another and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Notice the progression, bite, devour, and then finally, consume. So it's this progress, I know, did you like that? my visuals? It's this progressive notion that if you allow the flesh to set up a beachhead, set up a place where it can then launch its nasty attacks against your spirit, against your being, against your life, it will lead you to first they'll be biting, then they'll be devouring as it progresses, and finally you might actually just consume one another. So the flesh, if left unchecked, is just going to run rampant, and you know where the destruction ends is anybody's guess, but it will just ramp up and ramp up. But a way to guard against this, he says, I say, walk in the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. And he goes on to, again, talk about using this war language. The flesh is against the spirit. The spirit is against the flesh. They're in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing what you want to do. And then he goes on to describe, you know, what some of that opposing uh, behavior would be in the flesh. Uh, sexual immorality, impurity, but particularly when it comes to peace, I think we're looking at hostilities, strife, and jealousy. That's the opposite of peace, isn't it? If we're meant to be people of peace, uh, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we, we shouldn't be getting into hostilities with each other. We shouldn't be getting into strife. What's the problem? And we certainly should not be jealous one of another. And he points out uh, that obviously the opposite of this, then the fruit of the Spirit being peace uh, and all the gentle, all the Christian graces that he mentions there. But notice the type of warring language. He first talks about in those early verses about the war without, the war between each other. But where does it stem from? It stems from, as we go on to verse 16, the war within. So the war, the strife, the problems that we have outside where we give you know, rain to the flesh to do what it wants to do is because we're not working on the war inside. 
that's where the war is. We've got to deal with the war within if we want to prevent the war without. That battle between the flesh and the spirit. And it's difficult. It is difficult, you know. Um, and I will come on to uh, where I didn't get it so right uh, in one instance. But it is a difficult thing. Um, but we do have what we need in the Holy Spirit to be able to win that war, to be able to fight each battle day by day by day, because it is a daily battle. That's what this language says. You know, the fact that the, the spirit and the flesh are warring against each other. That battle, that war is going to continue until we're glorified. And so we have to lean into it day by day by day. Each day is, you know, they talk about um, live to fight another day. That's what we're talking about here. Some days we'll get it right and some days we won't. And before we beat ourselves up, notice that Paul says, um, where is it? In order to keep you, yes, in verse 17, he says the spirit and the flesh are warring against each other in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. Now, people have read this in various ways. Some say, oh, well, yeah, you know, the spirit uh, keeps me from doing the things that I shouldn't do. And then others will say, well, the flesh stops me from doing what I actually want to do. Well, and in fact, it's both. Okay, it's both. That This is the lot. This is the human condition, even with the spirit there will be days where we will get it right. And then there will be days where we will fail miserably. You know, but we do need to lean into, into the spirit and its leading if we're gonna have any chance of success, any chance of knowing peace within ourselves, and then subsequently peace with our brothers and sisters and all the people around us. Paul, again, in Romans, and I apologize if you've already had this in the last two weeks, but. I just think Romans 7, 18 to 25, kind of really paints the picture of that internal war. Now, bear in mind, this is Paul talking to Paul, who's responsible for a large part of the New Testament. Paul, uh, who is filled with the Holy Spirit. Paul, the apostle. And yet he still sold out slave of Christ, self-described uh, slave of Jesus Christ. He suffered this battle as well. He suffered to live to the spirit as opposed to the flesh. But this is what he said in Romans 7, 18 to 25. For I know that good does not dwell in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I do the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it but sin that dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully agree with the law of God in the inner person, but I see a different law in the parts of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, the law which is in my body's parts. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. So Paul was under no illusions, okay? This was going to be his struggle day in and day out. He does recognize that the Spirit is there, though, to help him with that. But I think one of the things that um, we do need to take note of, too, is that Paul says, you know, there is no good thing in me. And so it's important for us to recognize that, no, even though we want to have peace, we want to live at peace with our brothers and sisters in church, with our families, uh, with our co-workers everywhere, we want to be at peace with people in the world. However, it's not within our gift to do it. It's just not within our nature. Our nature is the sinful nature, yeah? We want to do the things that the flesh leads us to, the, that the flesh calls us to. And I, I've got to share, I've got to share, I've got to confess here, okay? I got it wrong, I got it wrong. For all my talk and preaching to you this morning, I got it wrong, okay? I had a situation at work once, I was new, I was uh, probably the newest person there, 
um, and wanting to get on, as you do at work. I just wanted to get on and learn. And um, so we have different managers, and some of them take more time to teach you, others don't. It, anyway, they're both good, but, you know, I thought, oh, here's my chance. Here's my opportunity to learn something today. You know, we're a bit shorthanded, and that's where you get to do stuff, don't you? Because some people aren't there. So, you know, I'm trying to do something on the computer, and um, the manager needs to get on. And I thought, oh, I've got to kick you off there. Oh, okay, okay, you know, I just need to ask you one question. No, no, I've got to kick you off. Just exits out of what I'm doing on the screen. One quick question, one second, one second it would have taken. You know, so I, I'm in a huff now. I'm, okay, fine. You know, so I go off to do something else. Then another one of my coworkers comes along uh, on the computer. They've been there longer than me, so, you know, they know more, clearly. And um, so they're asking, oh, you know, I, I, I need to learn to do this today. Oh, yeah, and so, you know, they're having a laugh and a joke, and the managers, yeah, oh, yeah, you do this and you do that, yeah, da, da, da. I'm now stood, and I am seething. I am absolutely seething. I wanted to ask one question, which would have taken five seconds tops. But someone else, who already knows more now, is stood there for like an hour learning stuff, but you didn't have five minutes for my question. I'm seething. I'm absolutely seething. I don't even know why I work here. You know, I don't like them as a manager, and I, you know, I never, I never trusted her. Never trusted her. All she wants to do is get to know everything, and uh, so I'm not speaking to anybody. I'm not speaking to anybody. I'm thirsty, but you know what? I'm not making a tea and coffee, because then they're going to want one, and I'm not making one for them. I'm not going to do it. I will die of thirst before I make a drink for them. And I'm seething, you know, and oh, dear, and I can hear them laughing. Oh, 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 oh I'm learning so much today. Oh, really, just burning up, burning up. I'm angry, but I'm hurt as well, because I thought this person was my friend and would have a few moments for me. Seething, just pacing around. You know, when you're doing your job, not, not even looking in anyone else's direction, just doing what you have to do. And, you know, finally, I just couldn't take it anymore. So finally, stuff quiets down, and the manager's not under pressure. The girl's gone back to do what she has to do. Now, at this point, I could have checked myself, couldn't I, and just simply said, hey, I know you were busy before. Do you think you have a moment now? Well, now that it's not so busy, if you have a moment, perhaps you can answer the question I tried to ask you before. And even then, you know, storming off, whatever, pacing off. Um, didn't even get my answer at that point, so I had to ask a third time. Really not happy at this point with either of them, and just thinking, oh, this is the longest day. I don't even know why I took this job. I really don't, you know, I, I can do other things. I, I don't need them, I'll just study something else. I, it doesn't matter if I don't learn, but I refuse to look at them. I still refuse to make a drink, and I am dying of thirst at this point, but I'm not making any drinks for anybody. Okay, because I'm not happy with you at the moment because you're stopping my progress. Anyway, day goes on. I ultimately, you know, get through the afternoon, things warm up, and I'm back to my usual self. But for the rest of the day and for the rest of the week, I had no peace. I had absolutely no peace. I prayed about it. I confessed it to the Lord. I said, you know, it, I, it, I'm in the wrong here. I recognize that I'm in the wrong here. Still couldn't find the peace because I'm still seething. I'm still seething, you know. And why was I seething? Now, I could have just let that go, couldn't I? I could have tried to keep the peace. I didn't have to. And, I, yeah, I didn't make a huge deal, perhaps outwardly, but inwardly, my attitude was wrong. Inwardly, I was still envying, wasn't I, I think, at the end of the day, because I wanted to learn. Because the faster I learn, the quicker I move up, and then I can show all of you I'm better than you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have a very competitive nature. I try to keep it under wraps, but that's the truth. I have a very competitive nature. And I think that was at the heart of it. So I'm hurt and disturbed in my spirit, number one, because I knew better. Because at not at one point that I stop to ask the Lord to check my attitude, not at one point that I stop to say, hey, I'm giving rise to the flesh here and not leaning into the spirit. I'm not, not walking by the spirit, as Paul says, let alone following. 
I'm sure if I had stopped for one second, I would have realized, hey, th this is not a deal breaker. You know, these are your coworkers. You have a good time together. We're all here for the same purpose, and we all work together. We would never harm one another. It just wasn't that sort of place, you know. It was me. It was my flesh. And I guess I say that to say, um, and I think these are two of the takeaways. I may not get to some other stuff, but I think these are two of the takeaways um, that God wants us to focus on with this idea of having that uh, the fruit of the Spirit in terms of peace and being able to, to live one with another. The idea is, number one, we have to not be complacent. And I realized that's what I was because I was shocked. I was shocked and disappointed with myself that I could sink that low, that I could, you know, normally me who gets on with everyone, you know, never wants to, to make an argument, is always the one to try to bring people together for peace. All of that was out the window. I couldn't even find that in myself. I, I couldn't even recognize that that was something that, that I could be and something that I could do. Here I was just envying uh, full of strife, full of contention, full of anger. I had become complacent. I had become complacent. I haven't arrived. I have not arrived. Just like Paul, the good that I would do, I don't. But the bad that I would not do, that's what I ended up doing. But I was blindsided. We cannot be complacent when it comes to the flesh. Paul says in uh, verse 24, now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Crucified. Think of a science fiction movie. Say maybe like Terminator 2. Okay? Anybody seen Terminator 2? That T, is it the T-1000? The new Terminator. Oh, Martin, I thought you know. All right. Say Arnold Schwarzenegger is the old Terminator. And then there's this new generation pay, played by Robert Patrick. And he's able to meld into different shapes and take liquid metal forms and that. But the point is, every time they think they've given him the death blow, he comes back again and comes back again. And that's the way our flesh is. Yes, it's crucified and it's nailed to the cross. It's not dead, though. It's dying. It's dying. And so because of that, it is still, it's vanquished, but it's still very virulent. There is a lot of power in there still, okay? It will still resist. It will still resist the spirit. And so we have to still resist the flesh. We've crucified it in principle, but we need to make sure that we're crucifying it in practice. And the only way that we can do that is to lean into the leading of the Spirit. So we can't be complacent. And the other thing is that we have to make sure, though, and be careful, we do have to be compliant. We have to do our part to lean into the leading of the Spirit. You know, Paul talks about verse 16, I say, walk by the Spirit. Again, verse 24, over 25, if we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit. And verse 18, he talks about if you are led by the Spirit. So it doesn't say, you know, that the Spirit kind of forces you to do something. These are verbs that suggest we've got to do something to follow, to allow ourselves to, to be led, to walk in the Spirit. We have to do our part so we can't be complacent. But indeed, we do need to be compliant. So the peace, the peace that God is, is talking about here. And again, different commentators say, oh, it's Paul's talking about our peace with God. That's always there. That's always at play, isn't it? You know, Jesus Christ is our peace. And because he's made our peace with God, it's him who sends us the spirit who then sows the seeds of peace, the, the fruit, the seeds for the fruit of peace to come alive within us. So God, it, you know, at play always is our peace with God. It's what makes all of this possible. But he's talking about peace within ourselves, and he's talking about peace with other people. Um, there's an American pastor, David Jeremiah. You may have seen him on some TV programs or heard him on the radio. I love his definition of the spiritual fruit of peace. He says, it's both a supernatural calm amid chaos and the ability to bring harmony to divided factions, a supernatural calm 
amid chaos. That's that inner peace that some were talking about. Um, and the ability to bring harmony to divided factions. Basically, what Paul is saying here, to make sure that we're not biting and devouring and consuming one another. To make sure that we're not being boastful and challenging one another and envying one another, but actually showing some humility and encouraging one another instead of provoking one another. Um, and instead of challenging learning to work together, swapping that spirit of competition for the spirit of collaboration, learning to work together, make the peace, let it go. You know, it's not about being a doormat because we do have to stand up and speak the truth in love and stand up for what's right. But it's just about, just let it go. You know, you don't always have to answer back. Don't always have to have the last word. Don't always have to be the top dog. Just be happy to be. God's got your back. He's going to advance us. It's about trusting that God is going to work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We don't need to strive and we don't need to envy because God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of his children. Each and every one of his children. We just have to trust that. And why does it matter? You know, why does it matter? And I think these will be my, my closing remarks. It matters because... Showing the spiritual fruit of peace, being people of peace, calm within, peaceful with people without, it's a matter of identity. It is a matter of identity. That's who we're supposed to be. It shows that we are the people of God. Romans 12, 8, 18 reminds us, um, Paul says, if it's possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. This is what God wants for us. Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue peace with all people and the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And then finally, Matthew 5, 9 from the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called sons of God. Displaying the fruit of the spirit that is peace is part of our identity but it's also, it's confirmation of our identity and confirmation that we're in Christ and we're going to have that inheritance. Because Paul says, again in the reading, speaking about all the, uh, the, the, the works of the flesh, whoever does those things is not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And we are co-heirs with Christ. And so we have to be showing all the fruit of the Spirit, including the fruit of peace. So, as I conclude, lean into it, don't be complacent, and be careful about your compliance. But basically, you've got to stand up, we've got to engage. You have to engage in the war if you want to actually enjoy the peace. Peace with God, peace within, peace with each other. Amen. Amen. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, I'm going to use old age as 